And now we come to the supreme root event within the Christian experience that creates an astonishment continuously. And this has to do with the ministry and the mission of Jesus, um, whom the prophets had foretold that he would come. He would be the Messiah who would bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And finally, the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary, who was the descendant of David, and announced that through her, this promised Messiah will come. So I want to comment a bit uh, on uh, the various ways in which the presence and work of Jesus is a, an abiding astonishment. When he was ready to begin his ministry, why he went to the uh, synagogue in Nazareth where he had lived and grew up, where he had worked as a carpenter for some years, and he uh, went into that synagogue and they gave him a, a passage of scripture to read, and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the passage he read and from Isaiah chapter 61. And then he sat down and he preached his first sermon, and he folded up the scroll, preached his first sermon, and it was only one sentence long. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. Now, what does he mean by that? He meant that he is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. For these passages read from the prophet Isaiah, were promises about the coming kingdom, the coming Messiah and his kingdom, who will bring about God's will on earth. So by reading that passage and saying, today this scripture is fulfilled, Jesus was declaring that he is the promised Messiah through whom the kingdom of God breaks through on earth. For the next three years in his ministry, he demonstrated that that is true. He cast out demons, he healed the sick. He released women from oppression. He, he uh, taught the sermon of, of, he taught the ethics of the kingdom as he taught the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is an amazing uh, account of the way in which the ethics of this kingdom function. Let me read several of the passages here from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and are thirsty for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be merciful. Blessed are the poor and pure in heart, for they will be called the sons of God, and on and on. Uh, describing the ethics and the spirit of this kingdom that he represents in his life and in his ministry. At one point he asked the disciples, who do you think I am? And they confessed boldly, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We believe you are truly the Messiah who has promised to come. Shortly after that, Jesus went out into the, um, uh, Jesus uh, uh, was uh, up in Galilee, which was uh, his uh, traditional home. And uh, thousands of people were coming to hear him. And so he said to the disciples, let's feed them. And the disciples said, are you, Jesus, I mean, I'll, you must be, uh, how, how can you feed all these people? He said, what you have? And they found a little boy with uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus had them all sit down, these 5,000 men plus women and children. And then he began to break the bread and he fed these 5,000 plus people, uh, miraculously breaking this bread and breaking this fish. From that time on, it wasn't just the disciples who believed that Jesus is the Messiah. All of Galilee, all of Israel was beginning to believe that he must be the Messiah. And so they came to Jesus and by force attempted to make him become their king. When we talk about Islam, we'll talk about within Islam, Muhammad receiving an invitation to become the general in an army and to lead a political movement uh, to establish the faith of Islam in Arabia. Jesus received this same invitation. I should say Muhammad accepted that invitation. Jesus received the same invitation here in Galilee 
where they come and by force attempt to make him become their king. Not only did they believe he is the Messiah, but they believed Jesus would make a very good king. At that time in Galilee, they were having an insurrection, fighting against these polytheistic Romans. And so the grand plan would be that Jesus would become the general in their army that was fighting against the Romans, um, and he could just break bread and break fish and feed the troops without any trouble getting food to them anymore. And with his mighty miracle working power, he could, uh, he could blind the Roman soldiers or whatever he wanted to do and have victory over them. So by force, they came and tried to make Jesus become their king. They didn't just come and say, Jesus, please become our king. No, by force, they attempted to make him become their king. He rejected that invitation, absolutely. And he, said he, and, and he, spent, he left them immediately. And that night he spent alone in the wilderness in prayer, sent his disciples on their way elsewhere. And uh, after that night of prayer, he met the disciples again later. And he said to them, come, we have a journey to make. And it's a journey to Jerusalem. And in the Gospels, we read that from then on, he set his face resolutely to go to Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? Ah, he said to the disciples, in Jerusalem, they will arrest me, they will beat me, they will flog me, they will spit upon me, they will, they will uh, insult me, and they will crucify me. He called himself the Son of Man. They will crucify the Son of Man. And Peter said, Jesus, that can't be. You're the Messiah. You can't be crucified. And Jesus said to Peter, you don't understand the ways of God. You're a problem to me. You know, you're a representation of the devil himself who is attempting to prevent me from being crucified. <laughs> at the center of God's plan, at the center of God's plan to redeem the world, to bring about the, for the establishment of his kingdom, is the suffering redemptive love revealed in that cross. And so Jesus resolutely sets his face to go to Jerusalem. As he gets to Jerusalem, he gets on a colt um, and rides up over the um, rides up over the uh, uh, up over the uh, the um, uh, Mount of Olives, which overlooks Jerusalem. Here's the city of Jerusalem, let's say, on the plateau below. This is the Mount of Olives. Jesus gets on this colt, so he's riding the colt. Put Jesus on it up over that Mount of Olives. And the children began to sing with abundant joy because the children knew that the prophet, surely the children knew this, that the prophet Zechariah, writing some 400 years earlier, had prophesied that when the Messiah comes, he's going to ride a colt into Jerusalem. And so by riding that colt, Jesus is declaring publicly and clearly that he is truly, truly the promised Messiah. The children love Jesus so much, and that's why they're singing with such enormously great joy. Now, let me just read Zechariah's prophecy about the coming king on that colt. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt the fowl of a donkey. So he's proclaiming he is the Messiah. The next verse in Zechariah chapter 9, we read, The nature of his kingdom. Listen carefully. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's his kingdom. Isn't that amazing? It has nothing to do with military power. Nothing. He will break the weapons of war. He will proclaim peace to all nations. It's a kingdom of peace proclaimed, but not forced on anybody. It's amazing. <laughs> and then as Jesus gets to the brow of the hill and sees the city here, he stops his colt ride for a while and he begins to weep. So Jesus is crying while the children are singing Hosanna in the highest because they know that he is the promised Messiah. Why is Jesus weeping on the brow of that hill? Jesus is weeping because he knows what will happen to Jerusalem 
as it rejects the peace that he is offering. And truly Jerusalem, meaning city of peace, has experienced so much upheaval, so much difficulty. But I thank God there are people in Jerusalem that know the peace of Christ. I was just recently with some of them, with one of them, visiting in our home uh, in the United States for two weeks, Salim Munayer, working for the peace in Jerusalem, embracing the peace of Christ, forgiving the enemies, attempting to work at reconciliation. There are those within Jerusalem who have received that peace, but many have not. And that city suffers so very, very much as each one tries to find the way uh, without embracing this peace, this suffering peace of Jesus himself. He then goes down into the city and the different gospels describe this in rather dramatic ways. He goes into the city and he begins to cleanse this temple, which was filled with all kinds of atrocities. What were the atrocities? Well, the temple had a special area, especially for Gentiles, non-Jewish people who might come and want to worship God in the temple. This temple had been built many centuries earlier for the worship of God. And as, like I said uh, earlier in an earlier uh, a statement here, uh, as Israel was being formed at Mount Sinai and through the deliverance from Egypt, it was an open community to welcome anyone in who wanted to. And now when the temple was built, that same spirit, everyone is welcome. All Gentiles are welcome. And so in the Gentile side of that temple, uh, which was to be a sign of welcoming to all nations, to everybody, why the merchants had turned it into a great big marketplace. And so if Gentiles came from far off places, even like Ethiopia, we know one person came from Ethiopia at least, uh, and, and as people came to worship there, behold, it's a marketplace. There's no open spaces to even worship. And Jesus saw this, and he was very upset about this, that God's house is to be a house for all nations. Instead of that, it has become a marketplace selling goats and sheep and doves and so forth for people to offer sacrifices and no space for them to really do their worshiping because it had become a market. So Jesus got a little whip um, of, of twigs and began to chase the cattle and the sheep and so forth out of this temple, saying, you've made the temple of God into a market. It should be cleansed of all of this so that people from all nations are truly free to worship here. And I can imagine, the Bible doesn't say this, but I can imagine the children getting in the act and helping Jesus to chase out those cows as they got their own little switches and so forth. In fact, Jesus began to overturn the tables of the money changers who were the merchants there in that Gentile's court. And I can imagine the children helping Jesus to overturn the money changers uh, tables as well, can't you? You know, <laughs> just look at that, all the money running across the floor as they're throwing it over and so forth. So Jesus enters that temple with an army of singing children. And this army of singing children participate with him in the cleansing of the temple. The authorities came, they said, Jesus, please get these children to behave themselves. And Jesus says, if the children stop, even the stones are going to join in uh, this uh, great celebration of joy that the kingdom of God is present in this temple and that, and that, uh, and that uh, the, all the corruption is being cleared out of, um, of the temple courts. Just after that then, Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper, for his Last Supper with them. And he revealed to them that Judas, who was one of, he, Jesus had 12 disciples who worked with him for these three years, working with him in his ministry. And others as well, but there was three who, who, who he named as apostles. And, um, and this Judas was one of them. And Jesus revealed at that Last Supper that Judas is going to betray him. And uh, then when Jesus made that revelation, he got up from the table and um, he took a bowl of water and he knelt down and he washed the feet of the betrayer. Now this is the promised Messiah, the Lord of all, you know, the King of Kings, the Savior of the world. And he kneels down and washes the feet of the betrayer. It's amazing, just amazing. What do kings do to betrayers? Jesus washes his feet. And then that night, he is taken into the garden 
he goes into the garden uh, of uh, the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem. And while he is there, after they had this supper, then they all together go out there to the garden. Judas leaves them because he has his plans to betray Jesus. And they're out there in the garden. Jesus is praying and weeping and struggling and he knows what's ahead of him. And in the midst of all of that, Judas comes now with a whole group of soldiers uh, to arrest Jesus. And um, while all of this is going on, Peter, one of the disciples, thought, hey, if ever there's a time, you know, to, to fight a war, to defend Jesus, now's the time. And so Peter gets, his, gets a sword, and he, 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 he wasn't very good with the sword. Peter, I think, really meant to kill the servant of the high priest whom he attacked. That's who he attacked, the servant of the high priest. But Jesus was wobbly with the sword, and he only got the guy's ear. He he'd never he did, didn't get him killed at all, just cut off his ear. And Jesus says to Peter, put away your sword. This is not the way of my kingdom. Put it away. And then he picks up that cut off ear and puts it back on the servant's face and God and it's healed. That, that ear is healed. So even in his arrest, Jesus is still performing miracles of compassion. It's amazing. So then they arrest him and they take him and there's a crazy trial, nothing just about it at all. And finally he's put on the cross and um, those outstretched arms on the cross, Christians confess, are the outstretched arms of God. God with us, the Messiah, the one who's come. The one who is Emmanuel, God with us. You know, we talked about this the other day. If I come to you like this, it means I'm not going to help you. Or like this, you're on your own. You won't get help from me. Or if I come like this, what does that mean? <laughs> what if I come like this and say, I'm fighting for God? What does that mean? It means if you aren't careful, I'm going to smash you. If I say I come to you to fight for God, it means I'll smash you in the name of God. Come with a fist like that. But how does God come to us in Jesus? He comes with outstretched arms. What does it mean if I come to you like this? It means I want to embrace you. I want to love you. I want to forgive you. Welcome to my embrace. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. I was a couple years ago in the United Kingdom, um, central London, in a very major dialogue with Muslims. And my Muslim dialogue companion asked me in that three-hour dialogue, what does it mean to say you are redeemed? What is redemption? And he was standing at one end of the platform. And I walked across the, the platform to where my Muslim companion was standing. And I threw my arms around him. And I said, this is what redemption means. It means that God in Christ throws his arms around you and invites you and me to be reconciled to him, to receive his forgiveness, to be freed from our sin and rebellion and all that keeps us from being what we should be, to redeem us from all of that, the open arms of God inviting us to accept his forgiveness and his re redemption. That's what it means, redemption. The open arms of God in Christ come to me, receive my forgiveness, my reconciling embrace. He cries out as he dies, Father, forgive them. And in that cry, we are forgiven. It's astonishing. It creates an abiding astonishment. And Sunday after Sunday in churches around the world, hundreds and hundreds of millions of Christians gather for worship. And they break the bread and they share the cup, remembering this event. This event. Jesus says this blood that is, that, that, that is poured out on that cross is the blood of the covenant in which we are, in which we are forgiven and brought into fellowship with God. I should say that at that Last Supper, when Jesus washed the feet of, uh, of, uh, of Judas, why, he also broke bread and shared a cup and said, this is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many.